Hi, and thanks very much for stopping by my iPoster. My name is Maximilian Gunter. I'm a Taurus Fellow at MIT working with the TESS team. And in the next five minutes, I'm going to walk you through how stellar flares that we find with TESS connect to the habitable or maybe inhabitable worlds. And at first, we want to focus on chapter one, which you see in the upper left of this iPoster, which is how flares impact life. If you're interested in more about the background and lore of flares, then please check the lower left of this poster. On our hunt for potentially habitable exoplanets, the primary focus nowadays lies on M dwarf stars. This is because rocky or small exoplanets are much easier to find to be transiting around those in the liquid water habitable zone, which is much, much closer in than it is for our sun. So we're talking about orbits of days to weeks instead of orbits of years. However, being that extremely close to your star also means that these massive explosions, stellar flares, and the accompanying particle streams called coronal mass ejections can pose an immense danger for the habitability. Those stellar outbursts might blow away the entire atmospheres or deplete the ozone, having UV light coming down to the surface and even sterilize the surfaces. So there's a lot of danger related to stellar flares. And if you're interested more, read a bit on about the Carrington event that I describe in the background and lore section in this iPoster. However, despite this massive danger for small exoplanets in those liquid water habitable zones around M dwarfs, actually those stellar flares might be necessary to deliver the UV flux to trigger prebiotic chemistry and form the precursors of RNA and DNA. These are studies led by my collaborators, such as Paul Rimmer, um, Dimitar Sasolov, the Sutherland Group in Cambridge, uh, Sukrit Ranchan, and, and many others. So what we're really looking at is this sweet spot between stellar flares that are just energetic enough to deliver the UV flux that we need to trigger prebiotic chemistry at a frequency, at a rate that is high enough, but also not too frequent and not too energetic, such that they would pose a danger for the small exoplanets around them. But how do we find flares with TESS? Here we see a nice diagram of how TESS is scanning through the entire sky, really scanning through all the brightest and nearest stars, including plenty of M dwarf stars that haven't been monitored with such a precision and such long baselines before. In those first two years, TESS scanned through over 200,000 targets in short cadence mode, meaning pictures every two minutes. It also observed millions of stars in its full frame imaging mode every 30 minutes. In this study that I'm presenting here, we focused on the two minute cadence targets, over 200,000. What we see here is a little cutout of the image that TESS is taking every two minutes. We see the CCDX and CCDY coordinates. What you see in this yellow blob down here, this is not the flare. The flare is actually appearing on a star that is marked in these white pixels up here. If we go on and take a timestamp within the flare, we see suddenly a massive enhancement in brightness that we can see here. Going an hour further in time, this massive brightening event has disappeared again. And this is how the light curve of this object looks like. On the x-axis, we have the time in BJD. On the y-axis, we have the flux that was recorded normalized to one. And we see the first, second, and third image relating to A, B, and C marked in this light curve. So if we look at full light curve and we look at multiple flaring events, then this is typically what we see, a lot of rotational modulation because these flaring stars often have a lot of star spots. And what I marked with the golden stars here are the peaks of a few flares. Now in our previous study, we used a more classical method such as trend filtering, outlier detection, model fitting, and actually we leveraged already the Bayesian evidence to compare different model fits and really determine how many flares are in this data set. Now in our new study, which is now looking at the entire over 200,000 stars from year one and year two, we're leveraging machine learning algorithms, uh, in particular the stellar neural network that was developed by Adina Feinstein. So I really encourage you to look at Adina's talk, uh, which is in session 402 on January 14th at 12 p.m. The most amazing thing the test enables us in these kind of studies is that we can explore an unprecedentedly large sample of M dwarf stars. And to illustrate this point, I'm going to show you here a diagram of the effective temperature in Kelvin on the X axis. On the Y axis, we see the TESS magnitude. And what is plotted here in gray is the Kepler flaring star catalog published by Jim Davenport back in 2016. 
And because Kepler was mainly interested in observing selected FG and K stars for a long time, this is pretty much reflected in this diagram. Now, in our first study, uh, back for test sectors one and two, we could massively expand this number already in the M dwarf regime. So if I flip back and forth between those two diagrams, we see there's a lot of new blue points appearing, especially in the M dwarf regime and in the bright FGK star regime. Now with the test year one and two study, we can massively expand this entire sample. And you see just how much this plot fills up in exactly those areas of parameter space that were less explored by Kepler before, namely the early to mid M dwarf stars, as well as bright FGK stars. What I'm showing here are only the stars that we found that our machine learning classifier, Stella, has identified with more than 90% likely to be flares. If I include all the ones that have been classified to be flaring with more than 50% confidence, then we see just how much these numbers expand further. And with all these findings, we can and do study rotation versus flaring, age versus flaring, spectral type versus flaring. We can study the flare energies and we can create flare frequency distributions. But most important, we can connect the flares that we find in tests to the habitability criteria that I explained in the beginning. So how do we do that? How do we connect the flaring that we find in tests to any kind of habitability criteria? Let's say the time span of this light curve is 100 days and the maximum energy of a flare that we find in there is 10 to the 37 ERG. From this information, we can start creating a flare frequency diagram or FFD. On the x-axis, we have the log 10 of the bolometric flare energy that we compute from test band pass under various assumptions. On the y-axis, we can record the cumulative flare rate, so the number of flares that have at least this energy. So if we start with the largest flare, say, okay, there's one flare every 100 days with an energy more than 10 to the 37 erg. We can go to the second biggest flare, which has an energy of 10 to the 35.5 erg. If we put this onto the flare frequency diagram, the FFD, we see there's two flares per 100 days that have an energy at least that high. And we can continue populating that FFD diagram until we see more and more points appearing and we can go to lower and lower flare amplitudes. We can try fitting this line. And now comes the step where we can link this to life. We can take that information from prebiotic chemistry laboratory studies of how much UV energy do we need. And by making some assumptions as to how the bolometric energy translates into UV energy, we can connect this in this diagram. So we can draw the prebiotic chemistry zone. If the line intersects with this zone, we know the UV energy is high enough to potentially trigger prebiotic chemistry. As a second step, we can also connect the flaring to theoretical studies done by Tilly et al. and others, where they investigated the effect of charged particle streams that follow the flaring, depleting the ozone in atmosphere, and thus the next flare's UV light penetrating right through to the bottom of the atmosphere and sterilizing the surface. So if a flaring star intersects with this area that we've drawn into this diagram, we know ozone sterilization is quite likely. So for our example here, we probably would have little chance of life. And now we can go ahead and do this for all the over 200,000 stars that we studied in tests. Obviously not all of them are flaring, but the fraction of them that are flaring, we can put on these diagrams and we can link their flaring that we measured to the criteria of ozone sterilization coming from atmosphere simulations and to criteria of prebiotic chemistry coming from experimental laboratory studies. And this is really what fascinates me about this. This is an interplay between three, four, five different disciplines all working together on a multidisciplinary problem, which allows us one more step towards solving some of the questions of habitability on exoplanets. And in total, we find that a little bit less than 1% of all test and dwarf worlds would allow this certain way of life. And with all this, I'd really like to thank you again for taking the time to look at this presentation and for checking out my iPoster. I'm leaving up my conclusions and please come see my talk in session 415 on January 14th at 12 p.m. if you want to learn a bit more about how in this context we also unveil some puzzling structures in particularly young flaring M dwarfs. And finally, please join us at the Test Science Conference number two in August 
Thank you very much for your attention and enjoy the rest of AAS.